This is the second of a series of videos based on our book Towards a New Socialism. And it's dealing with in what sense the USSR was socialist. It's dealing with that because that's in the introduction to the book. Why did we have to deal with that? Because at the time we were writing, everyone was saying socialism has been tried and failed. 70 years after the Bolshevik Revolution, they said history's verdict is in and it's failed. And all those still inclined to call themselves socialists after the 1990s are obliged to offer some response to this widely held view. There are two bad answers, I think. One from the Social Democrats was to say that the failure of Soviet socialism didn't undermine the validity of Scandinavian-style social democracy. But in fact, we know that the fall of the USSR actually led to a treat of social democracy across Europe, including in Sweden. Then there are our idealist socialists who held that the USSR was never really socialist, so its collapse was irrelevant. The problem with is that this position leaves them with nothing to say about real socialist economic policies. They have nothing to say about the problems the socialist economies actually faced and their attempts at solutions. Social Democrats may accept that the Soviet system was indeed Marxist, but reject Marxism. And the idealist Marxists cling to their theory, a very superficial theory, while claiming it's not being put into practice. Now we think that social democracy sells short the historic aspirations of socialism and is an insufficiently radical response to the ills of capitalist society. We also reject the idealist view, which seeks to preserve the purity of socialist ideals at the cost of disconnecting them from historical reality. We recognise that the USSR was, in a significant sense, socialist. Socialism as a social scientific concept, drawn the slogan, labels a form of social organisation with a specific way of organising production. Socialism isn't a utopia dreamed up by people, and it's unscientific to build whatever features of society that you would most like into the very definition of socialism. In Marx's view, the basic difference between different modes of social organisation was the manner in which they extract a surplus product from the direct producers. This is what he said. The specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labour is pumped out of direct producers determines the relationship of rulers and ruled as it grows directly out of production itself and in turn reacts upon it as a determining element. Upon this, however, is founded the entire formation of the economic community, which grows out of the production relations themselves and thereby simultaneously its specific political form. Now, what is a surplus? Well, the surplus is that portion of social output used to maintain non-producing members of society, plus that portion devoted to the next expansion of the stock of means of production. And any society supporting non-producing members, including, for example, the old, the military, anyone doing research, must have some mechanisms for inducing the direct producers to produce more than is needed simply to maintain themselves. Now, under feudalism, it's quite clear how this happened. The mode of extraction of the surplus was plainly visible. Typical method was that the peasants would work three days on their own land, three days on the Lord's land. Or they would actually have to pay rent in kind. Here's a, a wretched peasant handing in his, his chickens to the, his Lord, and you can see his servile position against the gaze of his Lord. It meant the direct producers had to be formed, held in some form of subordination or servitude. 
and it meant that political and legal equality was out of the question. And it required religious mystification to keep it going. So the surplus extraction determines the political and ideological levels. Candler surplus is different. The mechanism is invisible. It appears to be a contract between equals when a worker sells labour power to their employer. The parties to the contract are legal equals, each bringing their property to the market and conducting a voluntary transaction. This implies that equal citizenship is not only possible but probably required. And the dominant ideology is not religion but the law of contract. Now, surplus extraction is quite different from this. And this is something that wasn't realised until actual socialist economies existed. So new and non capitalist mode of extracting a surplus because under Soviet planning, the division between the necessary and surplus portions of the social product was as a result of central political decisions. The plan dictated how many workers were employed producing necessities, how many were producing investment goods, how many were producing armaments, how many were producing rockets to put up Sputniks, etc. So the division between necessary labour time and surplus labour time was directly allocated. And this meant that money had a very subordinate role. If a factory made monetary losses, that didn't matter. Moreover, possession of money was no guarantee that the factory managers would be able to get hold of real goods, since the real goods were allocated under a plan. Furthermore, the resources going into the production of consumer goods were centrally set. So if workers won higher wages, it doesn't achieve anything, since the flow of consumer goods was not responsive to monetary consumer spending. Higher wages would simply mean queues in the shops, since no more labour was being allocated to the production of consumer goods. Now, if the rate of production of the surplus was fixed, when the plan allocated investment goods and consumer goods, this is obviously quite different from capitalism, where the wage contract does affect the level of exploitation. It does affect the level of, of surplus that's produced. Now, the plan set the ratio of surplus to necessary labor time. But for the whole thing to work, the plan had to be realized. There was no unemployment. Capitalism depends on unemployment to force people to work hard. Since there was no unemployment in the USSR and jobs were more or less guaranteed, the threat of laying people off didn't work. And hence you had a mixture of ideological incentives, Stakhanovite bonus pay, the practice of storming at the end of the month, and social stimulation to fulfill the plan. By the way, this is the old Stakhanov sitting in front of the mine. Now, the consequence of this is the dominance of the ideological level in Soviet socialism. Since the surplus arises from collective effort and not private contract, civil law is unimportant as part of the ideological superstructure. On the contrary, ideology and politics are central. Hence the importance of the unifying party and of symbolic leaders. As Marx says, upon this is founded the entire formation of the economic community, which grows up out of the production relations themselves, and thereby simultaneously its specific political form. You can get the book from Kindle, a Kindle version from Amazon. They also sell a print version. Or if you want to save money, you can get a free download from um, Alan Cottrell's website.